All right, let's start with a word of prayer. Kind Father, we thank you tonight for all things in Christ Jesus. And most certainly we do honor and reverence the spirit of our Christ. And Father, we greet you today with a hallelujah. And uh, we greet you with uh, a praise uh, that is do you. You've done all things well. You continue to prove yourself to be mighty, show yourself to be great. You've watched over us all day long. You've provided every need that we've had according to your riches and glory. You've protected us from dangers seen and dangers unseen. So Father, before we go any further in this prayer, we just want to give you glory, honor, and praise for being a holy God, for being all that you said you would be and doing all that you said that you would do. Today, Father, we've come to do a study in your word, and uh, we know that your word is record of your thoughts towards us. Those are thoughts of peace and not of evil to give us a future and a hope. Your word, uh, you said that it would not return unto you void, but it shall accomplish what you send it forth to do, the very thing that your mind has designed and your heart desires. It will come to pass in our lives if we would just uh, believe and trust in you. So today we declare that we trust in you with all of our hearts. and We don't lean to our own understanding, but in all of uh, our ways, we will acknowledge you and you promised that you would direct our path. Now we ask that you would let revelation knowledge flow, share your heart and reveal your mind in any way you bless us, we'll be satisfied. It's in Jesus name we pray and we boldly declare the devil is defeated. God, you are exalted. In Jesus, you are Lord and all who grieve the prayer of the man of God said hallelujah. Amen and thank you, Jesus. Well, right where you are, my brother, my sister, if you will give God a hand clap of praise as uh, we are about to move forward. Uh, in our study of God's word. As always, grace and peace be unto you from God our Father in Jesus Christ our Lord. We honor and we reverence the spirit of our Christ and we greet each and every one in the name that matters most. And that's the matchless and majestic name of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. The Bible is still right when it declares that there is no other name under heaven whereby men can be saved. And so uh, we're glad to be the recipients and beneficiaries that come in and with the name of Jesus, uh, most certainly there's still salvation and healing and deliverance and restoration, uh, breakthrough and blessing and everything that is needed is in his name. Uh, before we move forward, again, I do wanna welcome all who've come on and share with us tonight and just really appreciate your attendance uh, and appreciate your support. I am um, humbled and godly proud at the same time uh, that you have chosen to, to join us uh, even on a consistent basis. Those of you, first of all, from uh, TCI, uh, I love you with a never ending love and thank God for you. But then there are others who join us uh, from afar, from uh, uh, other places on, uh, on this plane called the United States of America and then even in other parts of the world. And so we honor each and every person who shares with us today. We thank God for you. I gotta say, Hello to Keevan Royalty Mitchell. Good to see you, son. And glad to see that you are uh, you are uh, with us and uh, sharing in this time of uh, of uh, Bible study and uh, and uh, searching God's word. Um, God is a healer. He's a healer. We've seen him heal in our midst so many times, and uh, uh, it's just good to know that he is who he says he would be, that he's doing what he says he would do. Uh, those of you who, who've joined us, most certainly um, it does take money to do ministry. And so um, we are encouraging you, we're asking you, uh, not begging at all, we're not twisting arms, we're not giving you amounts, et cetera, et cetera. But we're asking you, my brother, my sister, to, uh, to share in, uh, in, in the uh, ministry of giving uh, sow a generous seed into the ministry soils of TCI um, that we may continue to um, share with you the word of God and continue to do the work uh, of the ministry that's been assigned to our hand uh, in this time, in this season, and in this area in which uh, the Lord has placed us. You've done so well. You've uh, been so supportive. You've been uh, so consistent in your giving. And I just want to say thank you. Uh, and uh, tonight uh, we, we provide information for the opportunities to give. Uh, we can give on uh, our website, tci-charlotte.com um, uh, forward slash give, of course. And uh, you can take your bank card, your credit card, your debit card, 
uh, click on the um, donations tab and uh, give when you are instructed to give, even as the Lord uh, has prospered you and as you um, as you purpose in your heart. You can also give via Cash App, dollar sign, church favor. That's dollar sign, church favor. Uh, and you can give in that way. And of course, we can also give via, um, via our, um, our text to give. That information will be on the screen as well. I have not yet memorized that that information, so please forgive me. Well, let, let's get into the word. Those of you who were with us last week know that last week was a very riveting and very um, and very um, challenging time of sharing um, as um, uh, Victoria Morganson from uh, Brisbane, Australia shared with us from her uh, from her experience as a uh, as a black person, as a an oppressed person, even in um, even in Brisbane, Australia, and uh, and remember that we literally <clears throat> we literally um, looked at um, the uh, the word of God, and we use as a basis for our discussion the uh, the words of the apostle. Uh, Peter, as he wrote to the church, um, saying to them that um, the same sufferings um, in First Peter chapter uh, five, verse number nine, uh, talks to talks to us. Let's go to verse eight. I want to read verse eight. So First Peter five, verse eight says this, uh, and I'm reading from the New International Version, be alert and of sober mind, your enemy, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same suffering, undergoing the same suffering. Um, I would for, for the sake of this conversation, even call your attention to that seventh verse uh, that tells us to cast all of our anxiety on him, on, on God, on Jesus, because he cares for us. Um, very heavy conversation last week. Um, so many of you, I saw, I saw uh, weeping emojis, you know, to hear that the same thing was happening um, almost exactly as is happening here. We, we looked at the cases, uh, the different cases where one gentleman uh, by the name of uh, David Dungjai uh, had a knee pressed in his neck. He said he can't breathe. Uh, Tanya Day, was a, a young black woman who was uh, in in jail and died in jail under suspicious circumstances, just as um, just as Sandra Bland did here. Um, extremely deep, extremely heavy, and I think I want to take take time tonight. And I'm not going to be on very long, but I want to take time to kind of give us some perspective. And I hope you can hear me. Um, and, and understand what I'm saying. Um, all of the things that we're experiencing now, the word of God has prophesied. Jesus uh, prophesied, and we'll, we'll, look at, we'll look at Luke chapter number 21 tonight. Jesus prophesied that these days would come. Um, and I guess I wanna just offend you early if you're going to be offended. Um, once, once a word is spoken, Psalm says his word is settled in heaven. So once a prophecy has been spoken, 
then God can't take it back. Let me say that again. Once um, a prophecy has been spoken, God can't take it back. So what we're seeing now is the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. And, and while we ought to be hopeful and optimistic, what is set in place is set in place. And we have to learn how to endure prophetic fulfillment. Learn how to endure prophetic fulfillment. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about learning how to endure prophetic fulfillment. A admittedly, my heart is heavy because of all that we've been dealing with, of course, the plague, COVID-19, has been um, has been um, a major problem in and of itself, and and all of these escalated acts of violence, in particular, the acts of violence perpetuated by law enforcement against um, against black people. Um, my heart is heavy because on Sunday, Father's Day, while we're yet praying, uh, a group of pastors and, and, and believers just gathered to, to pray. Shortly after, there was a, a massacre uh, less than 10 miles away from the site of the protest. Um, four beautiful young black people were killed um, um, countless others were hurt I think the, the number is like 13 in total um, that were shot and yet all of this all of this is prophecy. How do we then endure prophetic fulfillment? Right? Like, how do we, um, how do we handle what we can't stop? And, and you know that I've been a stickler for prayer and intercession. Those of you, those of you who are, uh, who may be newer to the TCI uh, ministry for uh, two and three quarter years, the Lord spoke to me clearly and said we were to pray and to intercede every day. So for two and three quarters, almost three years, Every day we've been on the call at 6 a.m. And we've been standing on, uh, among other scriptures, Second Chronicles 7 and 14. My people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven. Then will I forgive their sin. Then will I heal their land. And I am... And we are committed to prayer and committed to intercession. But sometimes the purpose of prayer is not to stop a thing, especially when it comes to prophecy. Sometimes the purpose of prayer is not to stop prophetic fulfillment. The purpose of prayer is to keep the people of God 
through the process of prophetic fulfillment. Now, I'm not going to talk about prayer tonight, but I just thought I needed to say that because there, there's been this real, there's been this real argument. I've been seeing um, leaders in the body of Christ, literally leaders in the body of Christ, men and women that I respect highly, or not that my respect means anything, men and women who are highly respected in the body of Christ, who are literally suggesting that prayer is not working. Not, not remembering that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down the strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. What I just quoted was 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 5. Right? So the weapons of our warfare are not con this is not a, this is not a natural or a physical or a material war. Yet there are so many who, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute, who are worn out by the process of prophetic fulfillment that they are fainting. Fainting is a good word good Bible word for giving up. You see? And so I, the Lord just laid this on me tonight to kind of just share with you. And it's, it's really a prophetic teaching. It's nothing deep, it's nothing heavy. But, it, but, but if I ended this, if I ended this session right now, I, I've made a statement that is so profound that it should shift the way that we look at the time in which we live. And here's the statement again, that when it comes to prophetic fulfillment, the purpose of prayer is not to stop the prophecy from fulfilling. The purpose of prayer is to keep the people of faith, to keep you, to keep you, to guard you, to guard your heart, to guard your mind. You see? So I want to look at Luke chapter 21, and I, and, and, um, and I want to read this in your hearing first, and this will set some kind of context. Um, We, we read, with all of this started, we looked at the Matthew account of, of, of what I'm about to read. But I want to read Luke's account because here's, here's a point that I need to raise up. Luke chapter 21. And let me just give you a synoptic overview of this, okay? So Jesus is standing in the temple with his disciples. And it starts in a very, very interesting way. So in verse 1 through verse 4, they're just standing watching people give alms. Alms is, is, is the offering for the poor. And, and Jesus strikes up this conversation about this widow, this woman who has no husband, Apparently, she has no children. She is on, she is a ward, if you will, of the state. This woman is giving in the offering for the poor, and she's poor herself. Now, I won't, again, this ain't on prayer, this ain't on offering, but I think this is key for us to understand because as she's, as this woman is giving, in the midst of a time, watch this, number one, where Israel is oppressed. Number two, where this woman is dealing with a personal poverty. 
when she comes and she gives, she gets Jesus's attention. And he basically, he basically um, lifts her up as an example of true faith, right? She's a widow, she's poor, yet she's giving. She's a widow, she's poor, yet she's giving. I need y'all to catch this, right? Her situation does not change, yet she is persistent in her faith. Please follow me. Her situation has not changed, yet she is persistent in her faith. She will remain a broke, husbandless, childless widow. Yet she does not allow her non-changing condition to impact her faith. I didn't mean to say that, <laughs> all of that, but the, the Holy Ghost is just leading me now. She did not allow her non-changing condition to impact her faith. And I'm not talking about faith to get a car. I'm not talking about faith to get a house. I ain't even talking about faith to heal a sickness. I'm not talking about any of that kind of faith. I'm talking about faith in God, watch this, that has as its reward relationship with God. That's it. That's the faith I'm talking about. Not the faith that is attached to the material world. Not the faith that is attached to stuff. Not the faith that is a... Uh, that is attached uh, to perks, but it is the faith that is content with having right standing with God and right standing alone, so much so that that kind of faith would cause her to give out of her poverty. Now, again, I'm not talking about giving. I'm not talking about giving. Please, I need, I need to, I need to literally just, just, spoil the devil right now just pull the cover off. i'm not talking about giving don't tense up i'm talking about the faith that is literally just dependent upon god. it's the faith that says that uh that god is the source of my strength that god is the strength of my life that i am surviving on god and god alone In those four verses, Jesus sets them up, watch this, by pointing out conditions that have been prophesied that will not be altered. Things are going to happen. All right? This wasn't even supposed to be a teaching on faith. This wasn't even supposed to be a teaching on faith. One, one of my mentors, I had one of my mentors. Um, if you if you want to know why my faith is so crazy, if you want to know why my why my why my study of God's word is so intense, uh, and I labor so much in God's word, this woman is one of the people. Uh, men, uh, Sister uh, Carolyn Pitts, one of my faith mentors. I mean, had faith to move mountains, saw her move mountains, but her brother, her brother got sick and her brother got sick and he, and he died. And we were all fasting and we were all praying and we were all believing and all this stuff was happening. And Duke passed anyway. And, 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 and she came, she came to me. And by that time, you know, I had been consecrated as a bishop. She had come under the covering of, of the ministry. And she said, I'm just, I just don't understand. We prayed, we fast. I prayed, I fasted for other people. I've done all this and I've seen God move. But when I prayed and fasted for my brother, um, it didn't work. And the Lord gave me a word for her. And the word was this, that the highest level of faith is accepting what God allows. Somebody needs to put that in the comments. That the highest level of faith, 
the greatest expression of faith is accepting what God allows. So when God has released unalterable prophecy, when God says a thing is going to happen, and remember his word is settled in heaven, if God changes it, he becomes a liar. So if he says things are going to happen, then there's a certain disposition, a certain mindset that those who have faith in him must have. And this is not, this is not conceding. This is not throwing in the towel. This is not casting away our faith. This is not, um, this is not uh, doing any of that stuff. We ain't falling away from the faith. But at some point, somebody needs to deal with us. Somebody needs to tell us the truth that you have to learn how to endure the process of prophetic prophecy of prof or of prophetic uh, fulfillment. You have to endure it. You have to endure it. So in Luke chapter 21, the woman is giving. I'm almost done, I really am. The woman is giving. And the disciples begin to look at the temple. And the temple in Israel was, you know, Jeru the temple in Jerusalem was the epicenter of Hebrew life, right? Everything happened there. It wasn't just, they didn't just go to church there. It was where business was conducted. You know, it, it, it was where it was where medicine was practiced. The temple was the epicenter. Right. And so in the midst of all of this, the disciples turn <laughs> their attention from the woman who is giving in faith out of her poverty. And they start talking about the grandeur of the temple and Jesus begins. And I'll just give you, I'll just give you the, uh, the cliff note version. Some of you uh, millennials don't know nothing about cliff notes, uh, <laughs> but I'm gonna give you the Cliff Notes version. And basically Jesus says, the day's gonna come when what you see now is gonna be torn down. And what he was prophesying was the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, right? So Jesus said, all this is gonna be torn down, so on and so forth. And he says in verse number eight, uh, I just wanna read a few verses. Watch out that you're not deceived for many will come in my name claiming I am he and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Verse 10, y'all got to catch this. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earth, great earthquakes, famines and pestilences in various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. But for all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to the synagogues and put you in prisons and you will be brought before kings and governors and on all accounts of my name. And so you will bear testimony to me. Verse 14, but make up in your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed, even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. Now, the word hate is not necessarily conveying malice. The word hate is conveying preference. When Paul talks about, in Romans, when he talks about this whole concept of, 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 of Esau um, and Jacob, he says, and God said, Esau have I hated, but Jacob have I loved. Now we know that there's no, that God does not hate anybody, but what it says is, I'm going somewhere in a minute. What he says is this, he says, he says, 
I preferred Jacob above Esau. Not that I, not that I hated him. I didn't have malice. We'll, we'll hook up. We'll talk about this later on. We'll talk about the blessing that Esau got. Right? God blessed Esau so much so that Esau wasn't even mad at Jacob by the time they came back. So he didn't hate him with a malicious hate. Um, he just preferred Jacob. So here in this text, here's what he's saying. He said, and many will not prefer you. Y'all follow this. Th th things are going to kind of shift. Everyone is going to hate you because of me, right? Because of what I'm doing in your life, they will start preferring somebody else over you. It won't always be malicious. But that's basically what he says, that there's going to be a turn. It's going to be a turn. Y'all got to follow this. But not one hair on your head will perish. Stand firm and you will win life. He's prophesying all of this. He's prophesying the malice. He's prophesying the bloodshed. He's prophesying the, the shifts in relationships. He's prophesying all of this. None of this stuff, none of this stuff can be avoided because he prophesied it. It is going to happen. Verse 20, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Verse 21, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, let those in the city get out and let those in the country not enter the city. For this is the time of punishment and fulfillment of all that has been written. There it is. It's been written. You cannot alter it. I need you to hear something. Jesus just goes on and tells them that you won't be able to stop what's happening. Matter of fact, he goes on to verse 23 and says how dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers, right? We're living in a day now, women who are pregnant don't wanna bring babies into this world now, into the world as it is. My children are 33, 29, and 28. And this is not the world that I envisioned them to live in. Had I known that they had to deal with this, if I had my choice, I would not have allowed them, you know, I wouldn't have wanted them to come. And he just talks a whole lot about a whole lot of stuff. I want you to hear this though, and we're gonna move on. Verse number 19, I wanna go back to verse 19. He says in the NIV, stand firm and you will win life. In the King James Version, he says, in patience, possess your soul. Now here's, here, here's the first thing I want to, how do, you, how, do you, how do you survive the process of prophetic fulfillment? Watch this, you have to be patient with the process and you have to possess your soul. In other words, your soul is, your, is the seat of your emotion, your intellect, your will. And he says, basically, don't lose your mind. When all these things are happening, when all these things are going on around you, when all these things are transpiring, when all of these things are breaking out, when all of these things are breaking forth, when all of these things are breaking loose, here's what he says. I love this. He says, in patience, possess your soul. Stand firm. Don't lose your mind. Stand firm on what? Stand firm on what God's word has set to you. What has God's word said to you? Well, with every, with every prophecy or every problematic prophecy, you might want to write this down. Somebody might want to put this in, 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 in the uh, 
comments for every problematic prophecy or every prophecy that that guarantees you a problem there is always a promise attached to it let me say it again right you have to focus or you have to literally stand on the promises of god stand on the and be patient be patient see in the midst of all of what we're experiencing god is still manifesting what he promised you and so you have to focus or i'm sorry you have to be patient with the process not only of prophetic fulfillment as it relates to the problematic prophecy but the 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 prophecy of promise god has promised you things as a matter of fact god god works in darkness to bring things to light like as the world grows darker god's light shines brighter your light shines brighter darkness is a darkness is a setup for the manifestation of god's glory you might want to write that down darkness is a setup for the manifestation of god's glory and so you cannot lose your mind you you can't be like the people who are saying we've prayed and it didn't work and now let's do something else let's take into our own hands let's do all the kind of stuff now y'all know i'm a y'all know i'm a political and social activist i believe in political uh, let me change that i believe in social action one day we'll talk about political action and and my thoughts on that i believe in social action i believe that the very nature of the church is that the church is a prophetic voice to cry out against uh, injustice against unrighteousness in government against unrighteousness in law enforcement i believe that is the church that does not do that is not operating according to the church's design however i believe that in the midst of all of this and i'm going to show you scripturally in acts chapter number acts chapter number two in the midst of all of that we must be patient with the process of prophetic fulfillment as it relates to what god has promised you Look at Acts chapter two. I'm not sensationalizing anything tonight. I'm not gonna give you anything to run through a wall with none of that. I'm just telling you that what we're experiencing is prophetic fulfillment. And that is personally a, a moment of personal privilege. That is the thing that has kept me in this season. That it is a, it is a process of prophetic fulfillment. That every problem that I have experienced personally, every promise that we're experiencing corporately, it is a part of God's plan. And that's what's going to keep you. You hear what I'm saying? I see you. Uh, is that Adelaide or Adol? I, I don't know how to pronounce it. I see you, Sister Douglas. Thank you. An African witch doctor told us she wouldn't have children. But she got a word from a stranger and says that God has unlocked her womb. And she said, I had two girls and they asked for a brother. And we told them to ask God just gave birth to a son. Yo, I had no, I thank you, ma'am. I don't, I don't think you and I have ever met. If we have, please forgive me for forgetting. Or not remembering, should I say. I had no idea she was going to be on. Most certainly she didn't know what I was going to be teaching. You see, in the midst of all that you're experiencing, in the midst of the negative prophetic fulfillment or the 
the prophetic fulfillment of the negative that Jesus prophesied, the word of God is prophesied. I'm going to take you back to Daniel in a minute. You have to focus on what God has promised you. Because as in the darkness, watch this, of a closed womb, God shows up in the life of this dear sister and does just what he said. Hallelujah. Look how God just orchestrates this thing. Thank you, Holy Ghost. I did. Uh, all right. So Acts chapter two. Acts chapter two. Verse 20. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I just I said this just to create context to support my point that here Joel the prophet Joel actually prophesied this Peter was just Peter was just quoting him but he was saying that the day of the coming of the Lord would be marked by darkness. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon will be turned to blood, right? It's going to be dark. It's going to be dreadful, but that's when the glory shows up. That's when the manifestation of God's promise shows up. And what you have, to, what you must be intent on doing is possessing your soul, possessing your mind, keeping your mind. See, he will keep you in perfect peace. Jeremiah 26, 3. God will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on God, right? So if your mind is stayed on him, he keeps you in peace. If your mind is focused on everything, if your emotions, if your intellect, if your will is influenced by other stuff, right? You don't have a guarantee of him keeping you in peace. But if you are intentional, if you are intentional, if you are uh, relentless in saying, nope, first of all, I'm not going to be moved by what I see. Number two, I know that this is prophecy being fulfilled, but I also know that I have a covenant with him and I'm going to keep my mind on him. I'm going to keep my mind on those things that are good, that are lovely, that are just, that are pure, if, that are praiseworthy. Philippians chapter three, let me show you this. And I'll take you to the next one. Philippians chapter four, I'm sorry. Verse number eight, Philippians four, verse number eight. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. This ain't, this ain't the power of positive thinking. You know, Norman Vincent Peale wrote, wrote a book, great, great book. But this is literally being patient with the process and standing on God's promises. You've been asking God for a miracle. Now is, the, now is the perfect time for it to manifest when it's dark, when it's dismal. And this teaching ain't about miracles. This teaching ain't about nothing. This teaching is literally about how to survive the process of prophetic fulfillment. Hallelujah. So number one, in patience, possess your soul. Like people, people are getting, <laughs> Paul tells Timothy, he says in the last day, he said, wicked, he said, wicked and evil men will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And I, yeah, I'm, I'm quoting it. You can, you can look up because the scripture, the word is just coming up out of me now. People are going to get worse. That's what, G, that's what Jesus is saying. Here's what Jesus is saying in Luke 21. Like, People are really, people are really going to get me. He, in the Matthew text, he says, the love of many will wax cold. They won't even, they won't even know 
that their love is waxing cold. They won't know it. it like it won't be intentional. They'll think that nothing's wrong with it. He prophesied this. Out, um, so fellow Bubba Wallace, NASCAR driver, right? Found a noose hanging up over his car in the place where he was, uh, where, in, in the garage where he parked his car. He reported the noose was hanging. All the NASCAR came out, they were behind him. The FBI, it just, they just, li listen, they just released the findings of their investigation today. The FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Y'all got to catch this. The highest ranking police department in the nation, besides the CIA, but you, you understand? They, they, they're the FBI. You know what they said? The FBI said that they concluded that it was not a hate crime because the noose had been hanging in the garage since 2019. Let that settle in. If you have not heard it, let that settle in. Because the noose was hanging there last year, it is not considered to be a hate crime in 2020. wicked and evil men growing worse and worse. Some of y'all are trying to figure out why there's so much tension in relationships. This stuff was prophesied. And you've been, you know, you've, You've been trying to figure out why you being so good and you're not getting the good back. It's prophecy. So number one, patience. Patience. Number two, focus. This is how you endure prophetic fulfillment. Focus. Right? You can see everything that's going on around you, right? We're, we're in the age, it's, this is really interesting. We're in the age where we are being inundated with tragedy, with pain, with death, with bloodshed. I have not been able to bring myself to watch the 35 minute video of what happened on Betis Ford Road Sunday night. I just got it today. I hadn't been able to watch it. But through social media, tragedy is at the push of a button. At the push of a button. You turn, on, you turn on television, you see it. You're inundated with all of these, all of these images. Images that are depressing, images that are disheartening, images that are disconcerting, images that again, if you don't, if you don't keep your mind, they are discombobulating. It's almost like you can't avoid it now. Turn to Acts chapter 20.
and I'm about to close. Acts chapter 20. So now remember, first of all, in patience, possess yourself, be, be patient with the prophet. God, through his prophets, through his word, has prophesied these things. And watch this. If he prophesied it, then he purposed it. Acts chapter 20. So let me set this up for you. Paul is kind of set up, you know, he, he, he's, he's um, been really, really successful in his assignment. And without going real deep, he was, he was, the, he was the apostle to, uh, to the Gentiles, right? But he had, this, he had this thing in his heart for his people. Y'all got to catch this. He had this thing in his heart for his people. That's what inspired him to write in Romans chapter 10. Brother, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that though they have a zeal for God, their zeal is not according to knowledge. And Paul wanted, Paul wanted his people to see God correctly. To, to, see, to see things through the lens of God. So much so, I'm about to read this, that he interrupted his missionary journey and he said he's going to go back to Jerusalem and minister to the people that he loved so much. So verse number, I'll start at verse 20. No, let me start at verse 19. Paul says, I serve the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. Verse 20, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. Verse 22 says, and now compelled by the spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. Now y'all gotta catch this. Paul says, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm, I'm, cutting, I'm cutting my missionary journey to the Gentiles off. I'm going to Jerusalem and it has already been shown to me that I'm going to face hardships. It has already been prophesied. I wish I had time to take you back to Acts chapter number nine because Acts chapter number Number, uh, Acts chapter, chapter number nine, when Paul is not, Saul is knocked off the back of his beast, Bible says that uh, he goes to the house of a man uh, by the name of, of, uh, of Judas, and he sends a guy by the name of Ananias there, and Ananias said, I can't, I can't go pray for him. This dude, is, he, he's a killer. And the text says that he says, no, go pray for him because I have shown him what things he must suffer for me. Right? There it is again, negative prophecy. Paul says again, he picks it up in, in Acts chapter 20, verse number uh, 22. And now compelled by the spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me the task of testifying the good news uh, of God's grace. 
Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you, for I have not hesitated to proclaim uh, to you uh, the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock which the Holy Spirit has made over us overseers. And he goes on and he talks about that. In the King James Version, he says something really interesting. He says, but none of these things shall move me. None of these things shall move me. I am focused on my design. And so not only must you uh, be patient, but you must also be focused. We can go back again to what we read in Philippians 4. Whatever things are good, verse 8, whatever things are just, whatever things are lovely, think on these things. Focus, focus, focus. So now we are patient with the process of prophetic fulfillment as it relates to promises, but we are focused, we're focused, we are focused. We're looking only at what God has said. This does not make you insensitive. Matter of fact, the word of God says we should occupy until he comes, right? We, should, we, we shouldn't be waiting around now because uh, of these dark times saying, you know, Jesus come get me today. The darker the times get, the more insistent we must be on, on doing God's will. It's funny how, pe how people have told me, you know, Bishop, the way you preach and what you teach, you need security. And like, I'm not, you know, I get it, but I don't get it. I mean, I get it and I get it, but it's, I'm, I'm just intent on saying, I ain't never not said what God said to me and I'm not gonna stop saying it now. You have to be focused. You have to be focused. You have to be focused. Focused on your assignment. Focused on your calling. Focused on building what he tells you to build. Focused on doing what he tells you to do. Don't let, let me tell you this, everything that you're experiencing right now in a negative sense is nothing more than a distraction. The enemy is trying to break your focus. I'm telling you, he'll mess with your family to break your focus. He will mess with your finances to break your focus. He will, he'll, he'll, he'll mess with everything that's near and dear to you to, to break your focus. Stay focused, stay focused, stay focused. Don't you dare say prayer isn't working. Don't you dare say intercession is not working. Don't you, don't you dare resort to the uh, to 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 carnal weapons. Don't don't you dare. Focus. Number three, and I'm done. Turn to Daniel chapter seven, please. Daniel chapter seven, you've heard me read the scripture before, I think. Daniel chapter seven. So we're being patient with the process of prophetic fulfillment. We're understanding that all the stuff that we're experiencing now has been prophesied. So the problematic prophecy is in process Yet, the fulfillment of prophetic promise is in process as well. Secondly, we're staying focused. Lastly, this is the book of Daniel, chapter number seven. So let, 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 me, let me set this up and, and, I'm, and I'm closing. Right before we were, right before the, the quarantines were mandatory, right before you know, we, we, we were told that we couldn't gather in, um, in groups larger than, first of all, 10, 
of 50, then 10. Um, I started the, ser the Exodus series. Not knowing that COVID-19 was going to happen, even the Lord gave me a word two years ago that, it, that, that this was going to happen. He gave, me, he gave me a word that everything that we were experiencing now, it was going to happen. But I, I didn't know. So I was preaching this whole thing, and I said this. I talked about, you know, about who, who Donald Trump is in biblical prophecy. Um, and, I, and I talked about the fact that God said, and you can, when you get a chance, you go back and read in Romans chapter 4, that God talked about the fact that he was going to raise up Pharaoh to be glorified through him. He was going to raise up, he was going to raise up Pharaoh for the purpose of being glorified. And part of that, part of that process was Pharaoh bringing Israel into Egyptian bondage. Because remember, it had been prophesied in Genesis 15 to Abraham, for, or his name was Abram then. It was prophesied in Genesis 15 around verse 32 to Abram 400 years before what happened. Those of you who remember me preaching that message, I need y'all to put some yeses and some waving emojis and all that kind of stuff. I'm trying to, I'm trying to bring us, I'm trying to bring us to the place where God wants us to be so we can understand, we can understand not only, not only his acts, but understand his ways. We're in the middle of this. I see Letitia Williams saying, yes, I did. I see Julia McNair saying, yes, I did. And I'm just saying that I, I, I need y'all to hear this. So the thing I said was, Thing the Lord told me, he said, the Lord said, I raised Donald Trump up, but not in the way that uh, Paula White and, um, and, you know, and uh, um, um, what's my man's name in, uh, in San Antonio, uh, John Hagee and all of these other people. They, they were saying that, uh, that, that Donald Trump was bringing Jesus to the White House. They were saying that Donald Trump, you know, was, was a modern day Messiah because he was championing the cause of evangelical um, um, Christianity. They were saying all that. I think they were laying hands on him, praying for him, calling out spirits and all that kind of stuff. And he, he was, he is God's choice, but not in the way that they think. I'm setting y'all up for this. He, God put Donald Trump in place so that the stuff that's happening now can turn people back to him. And that's what he said. He said, I'm gonna raise up Pharaoh and I'm gonna be glorified through him. But before I drown him in the Red Sea, I'm gonna allow him, I'm gonna use him to put my people in a position where I can deal with them and cause them to desire me. All right, but now remember, here's the other thing that happened. The other thing that happened was that when it was time for Israel to go, the first thing that happened is there arose a Pharaoh that didn't know Joseph. So now the Pharaoh who knew Joseph was kind to Israel for Joseph's sake. But now this next Pharaoh or this next leader who brought them into hard labor, didn't know Joseph, so he flipped on them. And I'm getting ready to show you what Donald Trump is doing now. It's covert, but I'm showing you what he's doing now and he will do openly for the rest of his term. And should he be elected the next term, Verse number 17 for the brevity of time, and I'm, I'm closing. So Daniel has this prophecy. Here's what he says. The four great beasts 
are four kings that will rise from the earth, but the holy people of the most high will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and amen. So he says now that God's people are gonna possess a kingdom. That at the end of this process, God's people are going to possess the kingdom. The meek shall inherit the earth. The angel gave this prophecy. He gave him the end of the he gave him the end of the prophecy, and now he's getting ready to walk through the stages of it. So, verse number nineteen says, "Then I wanted to know the meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, most terrifying, with its iron teeth and bronze claws. The beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up." before which three of them fell. The horn that looked more imposing than the others and that had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Don't that sound like Donald Trump? Let me go further. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the holy people and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in the favor of the holy people of the Most High and the time came when they possessed the kingdom. He gave me this explanation. Listen to this. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The 10 horns and the 10 kings will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue the three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people and try to change the set times and the laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times and half a time. But the court will sit and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High and his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all the rulers will worship and obey him. Let me read this to you in the King James Version. I know I normally read New International, but I want to read something to you in the King James Version. And, uh, and we're, going to, we're going to stop. Daniel 7, verse 25 says it this way. He will speak against the Most High. I'm sorry, the King James Version. And he will speak great words against the Most High and shall, and, sh and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. He will speak, listen to this in the King James Version again. He shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until the time and times and the dividing of times. Here's what it says. He's going to flip on the people of the covenant. Y'all got to catch this. So right now, the evangelicals are literally tooting his horn. But pretty soon, he's going to show them his true colors. He's already shown them. They just refuse to see it. Check this out and I'm done. One more sight in Daniel. Daniel chapter 11, look at that, and I'm closing. Daniel chapter 11, verse 32. 
and we're done. It's 8.45, good time. Daniel chapter 11, verse 32. So when you read Daniel's prophecy, y'all, you can't read it chronologically because he's dealing with different subject matter. So he may, he may show you the end of the picture in Daniel chapter number nine, but in Daniel chapter 11, he'll show you the middle of it. So check this out. Daniel chapter 11. Verse number 25. I'll start at verse 21. He will be succeeded by a contemptible person who has not been given the honor of royalty. He will invade the kingdom when its people feel secure and he will seize it through intrigue. Verse 22. Then an overwhelming army will be swept away before him both it and the prince of the covenant will be destroyed. After coming to an agreement with him, he will act deceitfully. All right. After the church comes into an agreement with whoever this guy is, he's going to start acting deceitfully. And with a, only a few people, he will rise to power. Do you realize that Donald Trump lost the popular vote? He lost the popular vote. He won in the electoral college, but Hillary Clinton, and this is, I, you know, I ain't saying that Hillary should be president at all, but she won the popular vote by almost 400,000. With a small group of people, Donald Trump wins. It says in verse 24, when the richest provinces feel secure, he will invade them and will achieve what neither his fathers nor his forefathers did. He will distribute plunder, loot, and wealth among his followers. <laughs> you getting ready to write y'all a $4,000 stimulus check. He will plot to overthrow of fortresses, but only for a time. With a large army, he will stir up his strength and courage against the king of the south. The king of the south will wage war with a large, very powerful army, but he will not be able to stand because of the plots devised against him. Those who eat from the king's provisions will try to destroy him. His army will be swept away and many will fall in battle. Guys, just right, right now, the guy says, throw me in jail. I want to write this book. Everybody's trying to write a book on Donald Trump. I'm no, I know I'm not normally this prophetic, but Trump is getting rid of everybody who've been trying to destroy him. Verse 27 says, two kings with their hearts bent on evil will sit at the same table and they'll lie to each other, but to no avail because an end will still come at the appointed time. There it is. At the appointed time, it's going to happen. The king of the north will return to his own country with great wealth, but his heart will be set against the Holy Covenant. Now his heart is set against the Holy Covenant. Now, remember in, 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 in Daniel uh, chapter 7 we read? Daniel chapter 7 said, you know, he's going to do it with all of it. Now his heart is set against the covenant. Back then, you know, he was talking about two Corinthians. And now he's holding the Bible upside down in front of St. James. You, you understand what I'm saying? But now he's getting ready to flip on the church, y'all. He's getting ready to flip on the church. He will take action against it and return to his own country. Verse 29, at the appointed time, he will invade the South again. But this time, the outcome will be different from what it was before. Ships of the Western coastland will oppose him and he will lose heart. Then he will turn back and vent his fury against the Holy Covenant. 
He will return and show favor to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. His armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortresses and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination that caused the desolation. With flattery, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant. There it is. But the people who know their God will firmly resist him. That's where I want it to get. Verse number 32. But the people who know God who know their God will resist him. Listen, King James says they will do great exploits. Mark my words, as I told you earlier, the darker the world gets, the lighter, the brighter the light of Christ is going to shine in the church. There's about to be a return of the miraculous. That's why you got to stay focused. That's why you got to be patient. Because in the midst of all of this, God is going to be glorified and you will do great exploits. I'm telling you, this is the time that you need to focus on doing what God has instructed you to do. This is the time that you need to be busy working on every plan for businesses and industry, et cetera, that God has given you. This is the time. This is the time. You're about to do great exploits. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Resisting. 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 All this stuff that's going on around you, it is prophetic fulfillment. We are to pray, we are to intercede, we are to serve, we are to walk in love, we are to share the gospel, we are to do all of this stuff, but don't come down to the level of carnality. Hallelujah. I'm done. I kept you too long tonight. It's been one hour and I wanted to be late. Thank you so much for joining me. I did not, uh, I did not really purpose to say this tonight, um, but the Lord laid it on me and the heaviness has been lifted. So thank y'all for aiding me in uh, getting free from this heaviness. Hallelujah. Tonight, again, it takes money to do ministry, tci-charlotte.com uh, forward slash give. Um, dollar sign church favor. You can text to give. Whatever way you find most comfortable for you, you give. And again, we're not, we're not begging, <laughs> not doing any of that, not even suggesting anything other than give. as the Lord has prospered you and as it purpose, as you purpose in your heart. Let's pray, we're gonna close it. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you so much for this time that we have to share. Thank you for an understanding of the times. Thank you for giving us insight. Thank you for loving us enough to not leave us ignorant. Father, we thank you for being who you are to us, our protector, our provider. We pray for this world. The madness, the mayhem, the mischief. The spirit of murder that is loose. God, we stand on your word, declaring that even now, your kingdom come, your will be done. And though, God, this is prophetic fulfillment, you have yet told us to pray. And we continue to speak your word. and We continue to stand on your word. And we continue to believe your word. And we continue, God, to, to walk in your word. And we know that ultimately, Father, you are in control. We pray now for 
this world. We pray for our families, our friends, our loved ones. We pray for those who are connected to us. We, we plead the blood of Jesus over them, Father. We, we pray for the families, God, that are bereaving, lost loved ones. Heal their hearts, Father. Use what has happened to your glory. Cause them to draw close to you, but not only draw close to you, but to find meaning and to find purpose in all that they're experiencing and have experienced. We thank you now and we love you. We desire to love you more. I pray for each and every person under the sound of my voice. I pray that you would keep your hands upon them. I pray God that as this world grows darker, that the light of your glory would shine upon their lives. I pray God that each and every person would enter into that season of the manifestation of everything that you've promised. Cause them, Father, to, to manifest that which is in their minds, that which is in their heart, that which you've placed in their hearts. You, according to Solomon, you have set eternity in our hearts. So cause them, God, to think limitlessly. Cause them to be broad in their horizon. Cause them, God, to take the chains and take the handcuffs off of you. Take the limits off of you because you're the God who can do exceedingly abundantly above all that they could ever ask or think. In the midst of this dark time, prove yourself to be mighty. In the midst of these bad situations, prove yourself to be good. Now you give your beloved sweet sleep. That's what you said in your word. So those who will retire tonight, who will lay down, let them lay down uh, in peace. And tomorrow morning, let them wait to a new mercy. And those God who may have to work the night shift, we pray, God, in Jesus' mighty name, that the night would go by swiftly and smoothly. And that tomorrow morning, as we are waking up into a new mercy, that they would lay down in that mercy and rest peacefully till the time, God, that is designated for them to rise again. It's in Jesus' name we pray now. We boldly declare the devil is defeated. God, you are exalted. Jesus, you are Lord. And all who agree with the prayer of the man of God said, amen. Good night. Love you much. Prayer tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. Please join us. Uh, go to our website if you don't have the information. Take care of yourself. Take care of one another. Love you much. Good night.